I want to join with Steve in welcoming each to our assembly this morning. It is good to see a number who are visiting with us. We appreciate you and I appreciate all of you who are regulars here. It is good to be back. Enjoyed a really good week there at Eastside. Um, tiring week with uh, two sermons a day. Um, they were tired. I, you know, it wasn't hard on me. You know, it, it, it was a lot, but it was an enjoyable week and I truly appreciate all of you who came out and visited during the week, some of you multiple times. It was great encouragement to me. It was encouragement to them. And I want to encourage you to, living in this area with opportunities we have, to take advantage of such things. Uh, I will say this. I will be at Anderson Wednesday night. I'm not encouraging you to come there um, Wednesday night. They're just doing different speakers on Wednesday nights through the summer, um, primarily for their group. But there are meetings around, and I will be at Woolly Springs, Lord willing, Friday night in a different speaker meeting. I hope you can come out then, but go any night this week. Woolly Springs is a small group uh, that I know would benefit from your encouragement, and I know you would benefit from being there. And try to take advantage of such, but also be planning for ours, as was said. We've got a meeting it's only a month away, so let's be ready for that meeting with Brother Bill Hall. I'm going to talk about sin this morning. And, you know, there's a lot of ways to approach the subject. A lot of people approach the subject as though it's a joke. I mean, they make light of sin. They make fun of it. And, you know, I've always thought about how when, you know, governments are always needing more money. And one of the things they'll say, well, you know, why don't we raise the sin taxes a little bit. And, you know, and they mean taxes on whiskey, you know, maybe on gambling, on tobacco, whatever, you know, they happen to be. And it's just a joke to them. Because, I mean, they're all going to raise it, and then they're going to head down to the watering hole and knock back a few. You know, it's just a joke to call it the sin tax. Well, sin is serious. Paul said in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. And in the book of 1 John in the third chapter, John exhorts us not to sin. Verse 6, whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Here he makes clear there's a contrast. There are those who practice unrighteousness. They sin. But he said the child of God, the one with the seed of God in him, that's not his life. Now John is not here saying the Christian is a perfect person. For in the first chapter, he had cautioned us. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say that we have not sinned, verse 10, then we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And in between that, in verse 9, he spoke of our confessing our sins. So sin is going to invade the life of the child of God at times. But our goal ought always to be what is said in 1 John 2 verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. Our goal is to sin as little as we can. It's not ever to take and say the grace of God, well, it's just so abundant. You know, as Romans 6, there were some that were saying, oh, the more, more we sin, the more God can show his grace. So let's just allow God's grace to abound. That can never be our attitude. And this morning, what I'd like to do is go back to the beginning. Much like Jesus when asked about divorce, and he said, let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to the beginning. And 
It was a busy week last week, but I did this painting in my free time. Of No, <laughs> this is, you know, an artist rendition of the Garden of Eden, and I do not in any way suggest it's accurate, but it breaks up the black background, doesn't it? Uh, and I moved the little black box over Adam and Eve, um, just so you're wondering there. Um, that's why they're not seen. But turn back to the very beginning with me. And you know the story, I hope. In the beginning, God created the male and female. You know, the first chapter is kind of the overview. The six days of creation, male and female. Then in the second chapter, he zooms in on that sixth day when he made the male and female. And he put them in the Garden of Eden. And he gave them a restriction. They were not to eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, let's look at how Satan comes at them. Starting at verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden... God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree, des and a tree desirable to make one wise... She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Many lessons are taken from this. And I think you could, one way we could approach this chapter would be to note some of the similarities to 1 John 2, 15, 17, where he spoke of the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and how that she saw it would be good for the belly. It was pleasant to look at. It would make one wise. But the place I want to start is how Satan approached this thing. And what Satan did, we may not necessarily see this right off, but what he does, he attacks the character of God. He comes to them, and it specifically says he approaches Eve, and he says, now, now don't, don't believe that part about dying. You know, first, one thing he's saying, God's a liar. But look at what he says. For God knows, verse 5, that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What he does is he portrays this restriction God has placed on them. And as far as we know, and you know, what we're told, it's the only restriction. He portrays it as some act of selfishness on the part of God. God doesn't want you to have this because, well, then you'll be like God. He doesn't come and say, wow, this is some luxurious garden the Lord has placed you in. No, he attacks the character of God and says, God doesn't want you to be like him. We need to understand that when God gives laws, he gives those laws for our good. You know, Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, in verse 24, you know, Moses, this is at the end of his life, and he's exhorting the people to be obedient. He, he reviews the law, but he does a whole lot of exhorting. Do what God says. Reminds them of past failures. But he says in verse 24, and the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. Think with me for a second about when he says for our good always. What's the idea there? Is he saying that it it's, for our, it's to our benefit to obey God because then God won't punish us and God will bless us. Or is he saying that the commandments of God 
are really, when you boil it all down, they're really what's good for us. And I think both elements are present. Certainly, it's good to obey God because, well, Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to those who obey him. You obey because it's for your own good. It'll benefit you. But you think also the nature of God's revelation. You know, he's given legislation regarding the home. Would homes and our society as a whole be better if people listened to what God said about the home and people only had children after they were married? If husbands and wives stayed together? If husbands loved their wives as their own selves? And we go on and on with what he says about the home. Wouldn't that make for a better world? Wouldn't it be a better world if nobody were getting drunk? If nobody were stealing? If everyone loved their neighbor as themselves? What we have to realize is there are times, especially, and, it all, and sometimes it depends on the circumstance of your life at the moment, but there are things God says that can seem pretty hard. They are difficult things. And they may be things that, in reality, they may seem unfair because of the situation I'm in. You know, why should I have to stay in this marriage? You know, just because of what Matthew 19, 9 says. You know, we just think it's a bad situation. Let me tell you when you read the scripture always read it through this prism for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life know it comes from the God who loves us first John 4 in verse 9 what does the apostle say here in this the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved him, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. It will help me immensely when Satan's trying to put before me some temptation and say, well, God's trying to, unnecessarily fence you in. He's demanding. What he's asking of you is just too much. If I always remember what he's given for me, what he's done for me. And I, I want to offer to you, see this not just with the commandments of God. See this with whatever circumstance life may bring about. Life gets difficult. Life can be hard at times. And it's easy to forget that whatever God may be allowing me to endure, endure, allowing me to go through, it's nothing to be compared to what his son went through on my behalf. So don't ever let Satan make you think, God must not love us. God's just trying to throw his weight around, as we might say. No, he loves us. And along the same line, it's very similar. I want you to go back to Genesis 3 again and note the approach and the emphasis on the prohibition. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God has made. And he said to the woman, isn't it amazing how many different trees God's given you to eat from? And how the garden is so well watered and... No, he doesn't say he didn't. He says, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, I don't know just how many trees there were, but they had plenty to eat. They were well cared for. But what Satan zeroed in on is, you can't do everything. You're not allowed to do everything you might want to. You can't eat from that tree, can you? Look at Eve and her response. 
I think there's something significant here when she says, oh, now, verse two, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. When you look at the commandment as recorded in verses 16 and 17 of the previous chapter, he doesn't mention the word touch. He said, you're not to eat of that tree. Now, obviously, if you're not to eat from it, it would be a wise thing not to go over there and start handling the fruit from that tree and, you know, standing too long admiring it. But it just seems to me that when Eve adds those words, and he said, don't touch it. And yet, as far as we can tell, he didn't say don't touch it. She's beginning to see it. Satan knows that so often what we're not allowed to do tends to be in our minds bigger than what we're allowed to do. If you were to take some children and you fenced off two acres of land, that's that's a lot of play area, and you gave them those er those two acres to play in, but put a fence around it. How many children do you think be trying to climb the fence and get out? Or let's just say that you took that two acres and then you went over and you built a board fence around just a small corner in one area. Where do you think the kids would be attracted to? I'm not going to ask for a verbal answer or even a show of hands, but how many of you as teenagers have ever said to your parents, y'all won't let me do anything I want to do? You know, they, they tell you one thing you can't do. You know, don't allow you to go to that one place. And then suddenly you won't let me do anything. That's kind of like, that's human nature. And Satan knows that. And he knows how to take advantage of it. You ever look at our week as it relates to worship together? There are more than 160 hours a week that we're not gathered together in public worship. And I'll, I'll, I'll allow you to count your drive time in there if you want. And still more than 160 hours. And some people, all they can see are those few hours a week that we're expected to be together. That do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, Hebrews 10, 25. Boy, that's a lot. It keeps me from doing this and it keeps me from doing that. I have 160 hours. I can read the works of the flesh in Galatians 5. God's taken all the fun out of life, hasn't he? No, he hasn't. There is not a good parent who doesn't put some restrictions on their children. If you love your child and, you know, when they first begin to grasp for things and then you don't hand them a butcher knife and say, here, go have fun. You know, you keep that away from them because it's not for their good. God, as a loving father, he gives every good and perfect gift. James 1, 17. He has given us the things that pertain to life and godliness. But he doesn't want us running free. Satan only wants us to see the fence. He doesn't want us to see all the freedom that God's given. Don't let Satan fool you like that. And then a third thing I would tell you is that sin is that which brought suffering into the world. When it comes to sin and suffering, there are a lot of erroneous ideas out there, erroneous concepts. Think about Job's friends. How did they view sin and suffering? They viewed a direct correlation. They start out, Job, you know, we're not really sure what you did, but if you would just repent of what you did, then God would lift his hand off of you. Life would go back to normal. And Job says, I, I didn't do anything. Well, as the speeches go along, what they begin to say is not, well, Job, we don't know what you did. They start naming things 
and making accusations and they just tell him, well, you did this and you did. They didn't know. But they had in their mind that if you suffer, it had to be the result of sin. So they just made up the sins. Well, look at Genesis 3. And let's see the origin of suffering. To the woman, he said, this is after they have sinned. I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam, he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are. And to dust you shall return. And then verse 24. So we drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, sometimes there are, there are occasions when our suffering might be the direct result of a sin we have committed. A person drives drunk. They may suffer greatly because of it. They may cause other people to suffer too, but they may suffer. You know, people, there are other sins that sometimes they, they bring on us. But when we look at the big picture, it's not always that sin has a direct correlation with this specific illness, this tragedy, this death, but sin's at the root of it. It is so sad when sometimes things go bad in life, and they do sometimes. People get sick. Loved ones get sick. We go to the cemetery to lay to rest those that we care deeply about. And people will sometimes get angry with God. They want to turn away from Him. And what they do is they turn to the very one who set all of this in motion. It is Satan who set in motion the sickness and the suffering and the death that plagues this world. It is the Lord God who makes a promise and says, we're going to fix all of that. There's coming a time when all of that will end. Look at 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50. In this chapter, there were some denying that there would be a resurrection. Paul said, oh no, there will be a resurrection. And he says, verse 50, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption. And this mortal has put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death where is your sting? O Hades where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Why should we be faithful, steadfast, immovable servants of the Lord? Because there's going to be victory. There's going to be victory over death only in Christ. Become angry with God and turn to serve the one who brought suffering and death into the world 
And let me tell you, you'll still suffer and you'll still die. But you'll never gain the victory. In the Revelation, in the 21st chapter, God's not denying that there is suffering in this world. But what he's promising is a time when, verse 4, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Life is hard at times. But even in the most difficult of moments, in the darkest of hours, when the pain is most excruciating, you cling to that one who one day will wipe away every tear from your eyes. Don't turn to the one who started all of this. Let's go back again to Genesis and let's, let's look at a lesson from the fourth chapter. I'm we'll call this sin can be halted. It's the familiar story of Cain and Abel. And let's just remind ourselves exactly what's said. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. We start out with Cain offering some type of offering unto God that was not accepted. God doesn't give us the specifics of why he respected the one versus the other, except that Hebrews 11 and verse 4 said that by faith, Abel offered the more excellent sacrifice. Faith is not just some subjective emotion, but as he, Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Evidently, God had given instruction as to how they were to offer their sacrifice. One listened and the other didn't. And then what does Cain do? Cain becomes filled with resentment toward his brother. He's jealous. In 1 John, the third chapter, where John is exhorting them to do two things, practice righteousness and love their brother. He says in verse 11, for this is the message that, we, that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. He went from the wrong kind of worship to hatred of his brother, to the killing of his brother. And one of the things I think we see in this is sin has a way of being progressive and not in a good sense. It just keeps working its way. One thing leads to another. You know, we saw in 2 Samuel 11, one of the great biblical illustrations of this is David sees a woman who is married to one of his trusted men, one of his elite 30. And he was guilty of breaking the commandment, you shall not lust or covet your neighbor's wife, is the word in the Old Testament, you shall not covet. It's the lust of Matthew 5, 27. He was guilty of that sin. That would have been wrong. But the sin didn't stop there. It led to adultery. Then ultimately it led to murder. And I would say there were some other things in between. If he'd never lusted after his neighbor's wife, 
he'd have never committed adultery with her. If he'd never committed adultery with her, he'd have never killed one of his top men. You know, and we just see that so often. Lewdness. The King James says lasciviousness. Some have licentiousness in Galatians 5.19 is listed as a work of the flesh. Lewd behavior, which Thayer in his lexicon said would include unchaste handling of males and females, indecent bodily movements. You know, I think it can include clothing that's provocative, includes actions. That's wrong. But that wrong often leads to other wrongs like the lust of the mind violation of Matthew 5 and sometimes then it leads to actual acts of immorality pornography is a great plague upon our society pornography is lewd it's unclean as Ephesians 5 3 and 4 would describe it but it leads toward that lust it often results in fornication in adultery it has destroyed many marriages. Think of Matthew, or 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10. The love of money. Elsewhere, that's called covetousness. It's a sin. But he said it's a root of all kinds of evil. It, it's not that it stops there. The love of money may lead someone to dishonesty in business. It may lead to neglect of family. You know, it may lead to embezzlement, stealing. You know, it can lead to a lot of things. One sin has a way sometimes of leading to another. Pride, anger. You know, we just keep going. And I'm saying all of that in part to say, nip it in the bud. You realize the one sin's been committed. Stop. And you go back here to first, I mean to Genesis 4, and I want you to see God saying that. To him. He didn't respect Cain's offering, verse 5. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Look at that, what he says, sin lies at the door. Sin had really already entered his life when he offered the wrong sacrifice. But as some of the translation put that sin is crouching at the door. And it's a word that's used of the animal, the lion that's about to pounce. God is, God is saying to Cain, sin is about to take over here. It's going to devour you. But, he said, you could rule over it. You could, one translation says, master it. You don't have to allow it, this free reign. Now what does Cain do? There is sin lying at the door, crouching like the lion ready to pounce. Does he rule over it? No, he gets devoured. He kills his brother. God announces his punishment, and he says in verse 13, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Well, whose fault is that? That Cain did not choose to rule over it. Did not mean he could not. He could have changed course. He could have gone in a different direction. And I want to challenge you. To realize if sin enters your life and you realize it, maybe just your own conscience calls it to your attention. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's your child. Maybe it's an elder. Maybe it's a preacher. Maybe it's some other friend. And they point out something. That's the time for repentance. That's the time to back it up and say, let's not let this keep going. Let's not allow this thing to snowball and keep building. You know, what will happen is two things 
can keep it going in our lives. One is pride. I don't want to admit that I've been wrong in taking that first step. You know, I, I have started down the wrong path. I don't want to admit it and back up. The second one is maybe I've started down a path that's bringing pleasure to me. I'm enjoying this life so far. I mean, David, he covets his neighbor's wife. Well, he doesn't stop because he envisions the pleasure of the adultery. But pride and pleasure, where are they going to end up leading us? What's the ultimate end? Cain failed to rule over it and ended up shouting, my punishment is greater than I can bear. It doesn't matter how painful it is to admit I've been wrong. It doesn't matter what pleasures one might have to forsake. Stop. Back up. Fix this problem. I don't want to give you a positive to end on. In Genesis the sixth chapter, there's not a lot of positive because he said the world is terrible. The world is so bad that every intent of the thoughts of man's heart is only evil continually. The Lord is sorry that he has made man on the earth. He's grieved in his heart. We, we, we sometimes look around us and we see a pretty wicked world, don't we? A world that is just I mean, you can go through the various lists of sins and you can see them all being played out for us. And you can see so often they're glamorized. It, it does seem like all around us that every intent of man's heart is evil continually. But in the midst of all of that, verse 8, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man perfect in his generations, Noah walked with God. I don't take that to mean, when it says perfect, some render that complete, that Noah never messed up at all in his life. We know he did after the flood. But Noah chose not to be like those around him. And he was successful at that. Conforming to all the evil around us, that's easy to do. Being different, Romans 12, 2 calls it being transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's a challenge. Philippians 2, 14 through 16, being those lights that shine in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. That's not easy. But here, in these first few chapters of Genesis, with all the ugliness of Adam and Eve sinning, being cast out of the garden, Cain killing his brother, a world just becoming so filled with wickedness that God would destroy it, there is Noah shining a bright light. And that ought to be an encouragement to us, an inspiration to us, that we can be like Elijah. You know, there he is on Mount Carmel. And there are the 450 prophets of Baal. And there's wishy-washy Israel. You remember him saying, you know, you got to decide. Are you going to serve Baal? Are you going to serve the Lord? And they wouldn't even speak up and say. But Elijah stood. You know, I, I think so many, I think of Joseph. The more you read about his family, the more you have to appreciate that Joseph refused to lie with Potiphar's wife. You ever read about what Reuben did and why he lost the privilege of being the firstborn? What Judah did with Tamar? It, it wasn't that Joseph lived in an age where well, nobody ever did anything like that. His only family did things like that. But he didn't. We can be better. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 13 says, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. He goes on to add, Let everything you do be done with love. 
It takes courage. It takes strength. It takes a commitment to love, love of God, love of others. But I promise you, we can do it. There have been folks like Noah and Elijah and Joseph and other great lights of the first century. And there have been lights that we all can look to in our own lives. People that came from bad backgrounds. People who, in the midst of things crumbling around them, they stood for the Lord. We can do this. We can be better. Well, as we conclude this, sin is wicked. It's terrible. But one of the things it will do is it will cut us off from God. God and Adam and Eve had a relationship that no, no two people have had since. You know, the closest that it would come to that would be when Jesus would commune with the apostles. But even he was in human flesh. But there was God there with them in the garden. And when they sinned, that communion was broken. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 would speak of how your sins have separated you from your God. We think about physical death, it's a separation. The soul is separated from the body. The one who's died is separated from his family. Spiritual separation means our relationship with God has been severed. Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. We're separated. We're cut off from him. And barring restoration, we'll be cut off from him for eternity. We will experience, as Revelation 21, 8 calls it, the second death. You know, we all read Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed to man once to die. But for those who die separated from God, there'll be a second death that's far worse. But in Christ, we can be restored. By His grace, and you look at the revelation as it comes to a close. It uses language that is so much like the language of Genesis. And I know that's intentional. Having said in verse 3 that the tabernacle of God is with men. This is the 21st chapter. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. In the 22nd chapter, he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And His servants shall serve Him. They shall see His face, and His name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. Genesis 3, sin brought about the curse. It brought about the separation from the tree of life. But here in the Revelation, he said we can come back and enjoy that tree of life forever because there will be no curse. But to enjoy that eternal blessing, You've got to learn the lessons we talked about this morning regarding sin. And you've got to have your sins taken away in Christ. If you've never been baptized into Christ to have your sins forgiven, please don't wait another day. Make this the day that you enter into Christ. And if you're a child of God, strengthen your resolve to put sin from your life 
and to live for the one who promises us victory. If we can help you come as we stand and sing together. Thank you for watching this video. We're glad that you have found our channel. And in fact, while you're here, we would encourage you to subscribe to the Jones Road Church of Christ channel. We have several videos already up. And we believe you'll find these to be true to God's word, helpful to you in your journey toward God. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you.